Okay, welcome to the first of three programs on Peoria Public Library history. And first of all, why are we doing this? This is for Peoria Reads 2021. Our book this year is The Library Book by Susan Orlean. And I don't know how many people have read this. I should have done a poll. Maybe we'll do a quick poll and see how many people have read the book. Um, give me just a minute here. Um, I should have had this ready to go. I'm sorry. Okay. So we're going to see how many people have read this book. If you can go ahead and click yes or no. Um, the library book is, it's many different genres. Um, it's nonfiction is the main genre. It's part true crime, part uh, history of libraries, part study of current libraries. It's very interesting. It focuses on the Los Angeles Public Library um, and talks about a mystery um, in 1986, I believe, the Los Angeles Public Library burned and they never really solved the crime. They think they know who lit the fire. They, they are sure it was arson. Um, and so it's an examination of that crime. Who did it? Why did they do it? They also touch on the history of the Los Angeles Public Library. Um, and they talk about the importance of library to people now. So it's, it's a really fascinating book. It really is a good read. Um, so I can see that uh, most of you about, let's see, about 58% of you have not read it yet. But that's okay because we are just starting our programming for uh, Peoria Reads 2021. So who are we? Uh, my name is Carla Wilkinson. I am a programming librarian um, and my job has changed a lot in the last year. Um, you used to see me in person for some special programs. Um, I also have uh, a lot to do with our summer reading program. So we're starting to get into the final stages of planning summer reading. So uh, I will be very involved in that. And then Amber, do you wanna introduce yourself? Hi, my name is Amber Lowry and I work in the local history and genealogy department predominantly at the main library. And um, you usually don't see me unless you come into the library unless you watch a lot of videos that we post. And I also have uh, accidentally become the Peoria Public Library crafting guru. So um, you see me around and sometimes you don't, um, but I'm usually hanging out and somewhere causing trouble, so. Yeah. <laughs> All right, so um, I took this on kind of thinking it would be fun to research library history and then Amber, since she works in the local history and genealogy department, was my right-hand woman um, showing me where to find all the information. So let's get started. Um, I will give you some instructions on how you can interact. Um, there's a Q&A button. And if you have a question at any point, you can type it into that box. Um, Alice Jackson is on here also. She will be monitoring the Q&A and we, we will take time at the end to answer those questions. Um, so she will be monitoring those. And if you have any technical questions or something like sound isn't working, something isn't working right, hopefully she can try to help you with that too. Um, but just go ahead and type your questions into that box as you have questions, or if you have a really cool story, um, something sparks a memory or something. Okay, so we're gonna be talking today about the history of Peoria Public Library from 1846 to 1968. 
Originally, this was going to be one program where we were going to cover everything about library history. And then we realized that um, we had that Amber was, involved and she kind of went <laughs> overboard. Well, it would be about a five hour program if we did that. Um, so we've we've turned it into three programs. So today we're predominantly going to be talking about the main library. So the early years, starting in 1846, the earliest libraries that we know of, and these facts are all taken from the Works Progress Administration file on libraries. And these were compiled sometime in the 30s, Amber? Yeah, in uh, late 1930s, it was kind of a way to get people back to work during the depression. So, you know, people would go around and take notes of things. So, um, yeah, it's a very good, very detailed history of libraries. So um, when we talk about libraries, we're not talking about public libraries yet. Um, public library didn't come about in Peoria until 1880. So in 1846, there was a reading room for the Peoria Mechanics Institute. And it says that their desks were supplied with many of the best commercial, political, and literary papers and periodicals of our country. So think of it as a place where uh, mechanics, members of this mechanics institute could come and read about their trade. Um, actually, the earliest talk of a library was in 1837. So it was before this, but they didn't have anything until 1846. Some others in 1852 that were mentioned, Cowell's Circulating Library, really don't know anything more about it than that. There was talk of a bookstore around the same time. In 1853, a library association formed, and there was also a ladies' library association, and the ladies met in a church. And then in uh, February of 1854, the YMCA opened a reading room. And it was open, I believe, like in the evenings, like early in the morning for a couple of hours and then in the evenings. So it wasn't all the time. Um, and it, I imagine their selection would not have been very large. So now we want to show you what did Peoria look like at this time. In 1854, this was Peoria. And I've highlighted a few um, points of interest just to help you orient yourself on this map. So number one up there, is Moss Avenue. And let me get my cursor here so that I can help you here. Number one up here, this is Moss Avenue, this line right here. The red line is the River Bluff. So it was kind of noted here by a squiggly line. I highlighted it in red so you can see it a little more clearly. Mm -hmm. Number two down here is showing you the intersection of Main and Monroe Streets where the current Main Library is. And number three out here is Knoxville Avenue heading up here. And you can see it ends, oh, I don't know. I think Dunkin' Donuts is right around here somewhere. So the city ends there. So you can see it, it's not a huge city, but it's a pretty decent sized city at this point. Um, Considering and, we were less than 20 years old at this point. Yes, yeah. Um, I don't remember the exact year that Peoria became a city. Um, sometime around 1829 ish, something like oh. that. Yeah, a here says that it was the original town. Um, and that would be about probably where the county courthouse is. Yeah, because there's Jefferson right there. Okay, so this is 1854. This is when we have these reading rooms coming about. Okay, so in 1855. Um, the Peoria Mercantile Library was formed on October 22nd. And then on November 8th, the Peoria Library was formed. And these were two different associations, two different subscription libraries. They were each founded by a different uh, member of the clergy. And in some things that we read, it says that they were two different uh, religious organizations, kind of like competing religious organizations founding these library associations, which is kind of interesting. Um, the picture on the right is from 1855, I believe. Um, there's a livery stable. This was, I believe, a market of some sort. And I think there was a rooming house here where Abraham Lincoln stayed at one point. 
Okay, 1857, we have our next uh, thing that happened, our next um, big move in library history. The Mercantile Library and the Peoria Library merged and they formed the Peoria City Library. At that time, they had 1500 volumes and they were located at number 73 Main Street on the third floor. Now, um, numbers, street numbers have changed we believe through our research that uh, this was at the intersection of Maine and Adams approximately, correct? Uh, I think it's there, it's um, across, it's Caddy Corner from the uh, Caterpillar building and it's, there's a bank I believe in there currently. Um, based on the numbers, it said that the, where Caterpillar headquarters are now would have been 72. And since it's across the street and up one block, reason believes it's possibly on the corner mm -hmm. so yeah we have to use a lot of um some guesswork but um there were several different sources that amber had to go to to try to figure out where number 73 was um and these organizations that formed the city library were then governed by members of both boards of the parent organizations so they combined their boards um in august the German Library Association formed and they had 700 volumes. We had a very, very large German population in Peoria. We uh, still do. We <laughs> do, yeah. Um, they were located in Austin's Hall. We don't really know what that means, but in Austin's Hall at the corner of Adams and Fulton. So, so approximately down the block. Yeah, not very far, yeah. So this is 1860. This is just six years later. We can see that Peoria has grown quite a bit. Again, I, I've given you your uh, markers to show you. Here's Moss Avenue. So if you remember from that 1854 map, there wasn't a lot up here near Moss. Um, here again, number two is Main and Monroe, where the current library is. And we can see it says courthouse down here now. So the courthouse still in the same spot. And then we have Knoxville out here. Um, and you can see that a neighborhood that's popped up out here. So Peoria is growing a little bit here in 1860. 1865, the Peoria City Library was renamed as the Peoria Mercantile Library Association. It was a subscription library. Dues were $2 a year and um, they moved they had been at 311 Main Street, which we believe is approximately where the Apollo Theater is now. They bought a property on the northwest corner of Main and Jefferson. So imagine you are standing at the county courthouse and you look caddy corner uh, to the north and west across the street. That's where this building was. This picture it's that you see where here. Where the Peace and Harvest um, statues are now. And there's a plaza there right on yeah. the corner. Yeah. This is not the original building. This building um, was built by the Mercantile Library Association. Originally, there was a house. Um, the Mercantile Library paid $10,000 for this property. So apparently their $2 dues were um, doing well. They were working pretty good for them. Yeah. Um, and I think they had a lot of investors as well. Um, at, at one point, and I think it I don't know if it was the public library. When did Tobias Bradley die? Um, Tobias Bradley at one point donated $1,000 to the library. He was by far, I believe that was for the public library. Um, he was by far the largest donor and that inspired other people to donate money as well. Um, Tobias, of course, husband of Lydia Moss Bradley, founder of Bradley University. He died in 1867. 1867, okay. So that was for um, possibly this building, probably, yeah. So in 1878, they tore down the house that was on this corner and they built the building that you see in this picture. And um, it cost them $32,000 to build this building. And the first floor down here was not library. The library was on the upper floors. And I believe the entrance to the library was over here on the side. And the, the first floor, they rented out storefronts to make income. 
So this was all planned out very well. They knew that they needed income. And so they built this building with that in mind. And you'll see I said businessman E.S. Wilcox was a leading force in establishing this library. And we will talk about E.S. Wilcox much more in just a minute. Okay, so now another map, 1867. I just think this is a really cool map. It's a, a nice perspective on the city. We can see the river um, and you can see how the city is spread out. The circle is approximately where that mercantile library building was. So right in the center of a bustling city. So library law. E.S. Wilcox, who was a Peoria businessman, wrote the first comprehensive library law in the United States permitting the establishment of public libraries free to all residents of the municipality, permitting tax support and outlining how they should be governed. Um, there was some confusion. Some people said that um, the Chicago Public Library wrote this, but eventually everyone decided, no, Wilcox wrote this law. The Illinois legislator passed it in 1872 and 40, 47 other states copied this library law that E.S. Wilcox wrote. And it is the base of what is still used today as uh, the law that governs public libraries that allows us to use tax dollars that then make the library free for all. So the public library, Peoria Public Library was established on April 20th, 1880. Uh, using this law that E.S. Wilcox had written. And we know this exact date because we have the board minutes um, that say April 20th, 1880. So last year, you know, we, we weren't open on April 20th, but it was our 140th anniversary as a public library. Um, they used the mercantile building. Um, the Mercantile Library kind of encouraged them to become a public library. Um, there were some business agreements and that if you establish yourself as a public library, we'll give you our whole collection and we'll let you use our building. So in 1882, and I believe the public library, yeah, the public library first rented rooms on the second floor of a building on Adams and Fulton, but it wasn't very long, you'll see, before they just moved into the mercantile building and they paid $1,000 a year to use that building. And then eventually the German Library, library Association also donated their collection to the public library. So then in 1887, here's another map. We have lots of maps. This is more zoomed in. You can see the river bluff noted here. And you can see in the middle of this circle it says library. So at this time, 1887, they were marking the library on the map. And then you'll see the courthouse right here as well. So this, these are the earliest pictures we have of library staff. The one on the left is from 1896. The uh, building at Main and Monroe opened in 1897. So we know that this is the mercantile building. Um, see these lovely people in their their dresses and their suits as, as and, long as i don't have to dress up like that for yeah, one, I, I'm, yeah i'm all for these <laughs> photos the library looks beautiful i would not want to have to wear a dress like that every day um and the of note in these pictures is the woman it's this is the same woman in these circles here her name was mrs anna archer um, the photo on the left um, said property of Mrs. Archer on the back. And the ladies were Emily Brudel, Irene Stewart, Elizabeth Ellis, and Anna Archer. Sitting was Laura Grant. And then the men were John Youngman and Harry Warshoots. So Anna Archer, I want you to remember her name and we're gonna come back to her in a few minutes. This is another picture of the Mercantile Library. Um, originally, we had this as 
the um, 1897 building, the main library. And we realized this is not the main library. This is the mercantile building. Um, and so it was a pretty- And it's the same day. It's the same day. Yeah, they're wearing the same outfits. It's a pretty elaborate looking building. Um, they really, you know, $32,000 in 1878 would have gone a long way. And so um, this is a really impressive building they had, but it was too small really for what they needed. The first librarian was Fred J. Solden. He was a German immigrant. Um, he had been a library assistant at the St. Louis Public Library. He was a member of the Bicycle Club and the Bicycle Club took a ride in October of 1891 to Washington and back. And when he got back, he had pneumonia and he died at the age of 39 on November 5th. Um, Amber and I took a trek out to Springdale Cemetery and found his grave. It's in the Masonic lot. Um, so that was kind of fun to go out there and find that. He was replaced by E.S. Wilcox, who I have mentioned before. Um, and this is very interesting. I found this in um, one of our annual report books. It's a bound volume of annual reports. This is a letter from the president of the board, letting the staff know that Fred Solden has died. Um, he, from what I've read, he was very well respected. He had taken a library that had very few items in its collection and built it up to something like 40,000 items. So by all accounts, very good at his job, very well liked. Um, so this is a letter letting the staff know that he has died and that Erastus will be his successor. So Erastus, um, lots of library staff know the name of Erastus Wilcox. Um, I feel like we talk about him a lot. <laughs> so who was he? We've named one of our roof riders after him. Yes, the uh, roof riders that sit outside the local history and genealogy department are named after two former directors, Erastus and Xenophon. Xenophon Smith was a um, director in the 40s and 50s. Um, Erastus was very focused on literacy in the city and making libraries free for all. Uh, in one annual report, he was he wrote a very passionate essay about how the children in the poorer neighborhoods of the city couldn't read and that we really need to do outreach in those parts of the city. And at this time in the, in the late 1800s, they were taking books to some of the schools in the uh, outlying parts of the cities, uh, outlying part of the city far away from the library so that children had access to books. He was very passionate about this, felt that it was very, very important. Uh, now we know he was- Carla? Uh, yes. Carla, would you say that Erastus Wilcox was basically our Roberta Kishelsky? Oh, he might've been, yes. Roberta, okay. our deputy director is also very passionate about making literacy available to everyone in the city. So yes, I would say that Roberta and Erastus have lots of things in common. Um, we know that he was a businessman. He wasn't a trained librarian, but he was very passionate about this um, and he wanted it to be free for everybody. He also seemed to be kind of concerned about vandalism. Um, I came across a newspaper article where he, um, he was very upset because teenagers were, were cutting pictures out of magazines and he offered a $5 reward if anyone could tell him who it was that was cutting these pictures out of the magazine. Um, he was very deaf in his later years. He, um, he was library director for a long time. So 1891 is when he started. Um, he was killed in 1915. Like I said, he was deaf. He stepped into the path of a streetcar at the age of 85 and was run over and killed. Um, so not a very good ending. His mind by all accounts was still very sharp. He was still very smart, but apparently couldn't hear a thing um, and met an untimely death by streetcar. His next two successors also died suddenly in 1921 and 1924. Um, and we'll talk about them in library history part three which um, covers some curses, scandals, and controversies. 
So here's a, this is a great picture of Erastus. The picture itself, you can see it is not in great condition, um, but it's interesting to see him at work. Um, I also noted that he apparently was not a very neat and tidy person, as you can see from all the papers stuffed in cubby holes back here and everything out on his desk. And while we were in Springdale, we of course went to see Erastus. He is in the Cove. That's the section of Springdale he's in. Um, pretty easy to find if you don't walk past his grave the first, well, looking for first somebody minute else. you get there and then um, completely miss him. Um, he is there with his wife and one of his sons. And on this stone, the other side says Wilcox, and this back side says, Father of Free Public Libraries, he rests from his labor, his works do follow him. So even in death, Erastus is remembered as this great public servant and um, advocate for free public libraries. So I said we were going to talk about Anna Archer. Um, we're talking about her now because she was the interim librarian in 1921 and 1924. She was born May 27th, 1862. She started working at the library in 1890. Um, she was widowed in 1891. And it was kind of interesting. We had to do some deep research on this as well. Uh, she lived in South Dakota. Her husband worked for the railroad and her daughter was born while she was in South Dakota. And then sometime in 1890, her husband became ill. And so her husband went out to San Francisco, I believe it was, to try to get better. I don't know if they thought the sea air or something would help him. And she came back to Peoria where her family was while he went out there to try to regain his health. He died in California, so she was widowed at age 29. So she worked for Peoria Public Library from 1890 until 1936. Um, by newspaper articles, we know that she basically never took a break. She never took vacation. She took little leaves of absence. Um, her daughter had married by that time and was living in Texas. And so Mrs. Archer took a leave of absence. She wasn't retired. She, she was gonna keep working, um, took a leave of absence to visit her daughter in Texas and she died while she was there in Texas. Um, and the newspaper articles uh, about her death sing her praises and talk about what a great loss uh, that was for the library. She's, in, she was also very instrumental in uh, developing a collection that we still use today. Yes. Why so, don't you talk about that? Um, one of the things that she started was actually doing a, um, she started cutting things from the newspaper and gathering them into little files. And it's what today we would call our vertical file. Uh, for the mm -hmm. most part, we don't actually have like a lot of clippings from the 20s, late 20s when she started it. Um, just because over time, uh, they've either decayed or been uh, borrowed uh, and not returned um, mm -hmm. accidentally or on purpose. Um, but by doing that and creating that collection, what was probably a few files when she was doing it is now a 10 filing cabinet collection that my coworker Deb has done an enormous job of sorting and organizing and just creating it so much clearer to follow. Mm -hmm. uh, yeah. And I'm we have Anna Archer work. to thank for that. Yeah, exactly. I wonder if she also, um, saved a lot of the things that are in the library scrapbooks. We have scrapbooks for the library where we keep any newspaper article that mentions the library. We clip out and save and have been for um, a long, 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 long time. Uh, we Nearly 100 years. Over 100 years. I think we have them from before 1897. Oh, the, the, uh, the, uh, <laughs> the scrapbooks start before 1890, yes, yes, but the vertical file collection didn't start until the 20s, probably yes. while she was, you know, interim director. Mm -hmm. um, this picture of Mrs. Archer is in the old main library 
I would say the second floor, probably. Um, I can't remember her maiden name. Was it Love? I'm, I'm going to look that up right quick. Okay, Amber's going to look that up. She'll let us know. It's, it's so great to have your researcher available and able to just answer these questions right on the spot. Okay, I'm going to move on here to the next slide. So now we're going to talk about the old main library. I put old in quotation marks because at this time it was new. And uh, first we're going to talk about Peoria in 1897. The photo on the left is around that time period. You can see it's a bustling river town, um, lots of industry, lots of river traffic. And then on the right, I have the seal of Bradley University, which opened in 1897. So lots of things happening in Peoria in 1897. Uh, Anna Archer's maiden name was Love. Love, okay, that's what I thought. I know we researched her a lot, but that was a while ago. <laughs> it was a few weeks ago. I can't hardly remember what I had for dinner last night, let alone researching three weeks ago. <laughs> yeah. So um, like I said, the Mercantile building, while beautiful, was small. The collection was growing and growing, and they knew they needed a bigger building. Uh, the Mercantile Library Association still existed in name, and they owned that building. So. It was here where this flag is. You can see the courthouse. And they purchased three lots in the 100 block of Monroe for a new library building. They purchased inside lots. They did not purchase the lot on the corner. Inside lots were cheaper. Uh, one account said that they were about $20,000 cheaper than if they had purchased something on the corner. And also building, the actual building was cheaper because if they had been on a corner, they would have had to have architecturally designed two fronts of the building. But by being on an inside lot, they only had to have one pretty building front. Um, the Mercantile Library sold their building. And this was again, another time when they said, we'll do this if you do this. So they sold their property for $75,000 and said, we will sell this and give it to the city, but you have to buy lots for your new library building. So they gave their $75,000 to the city to help purchase that property and build a new library building. And here is the new library building. This picture, as you can see, says May 20th, 1896. The actual library did not open until February 11th, 1897. It was completed at a cost of $67,852.34. Which in today's money is uh, $2.1 million. That's pretty good. I think they did it. I think they did pretty well. Um, considering what we know about what we had to raise uh, 10 or so years ago for all of our new building projects. Um, they moved 60,000 volumes, the three blocks from the Mercantile building to this new library building. They closed on January 25th, 1897. They moved and put everything in order in six days. It was two men, seven high school boys, and one team, I assume that means team of horses at a cost of $221.91. And all of this is noted in Erastus Wilcox's uh, speech that he gave when the library building opened. And they designed it with growth in mind. They knew that they needed something bigger than what they needed right then. Um, so, I'll show you some floor plans and we'll talk about that growth. Um, but if you look along here, you'll see that the front here has three stories. You can three, see three sets of windows. But in the back, way back there, you can see five sets of windows. And we'll show you better pictures of the inside so you can understand that. But the back was closed stacks and that's where all the books went. And when they moved in, 
I think they were using about one and a half stories of those closed stacks. So these three on the upper floors didn't have anything in them yet, but as the library collection grew, they moved into those floors. Also here, no, oh yeah, there it is. Over here, there's a house next door to the library. Um, so even though it's downtown, there are still residences and there's another building over here off to the side. Um, and you can see this is still under construction. There are, I think these are probably piles of bricks and things out front. So still a construction zone. And you but can see our roof riders and our owl at the top. You can, here in the center is our owl. And then the roof riders, I'm not sure which one is Erastus and which one is Xenophon. Uh, we call them roof riders. You might call them a griffin. They're not gargoyles. Uh, winged lions, I think is the official term. So here are these floor plans. And this, this was really exciting to find these um, because you try to picture in your mind what this building looks like from descriptions, but it's, it's difficult to imagine that. Um, so this again was in the annual reports. And you can see I have a line here showing where that break in the building is, that back here was five floors. We think it was actually maybe six counting the basement, but five floors. And in the front, it was three floors. And you can see over here, this is the first floor. So the entrance is down here at the bottom. And to get to the library, you would go up the stairs. But down here on the first floor, you see it says superintendent of schools over here on the left and school board on the right and other school board rooms. Once again, this building was created uh, to make income. So they rented out office space on this first floor to the school board. And I, I'm not exactly sure, you know, we don't have any documents that show the agreement there, but it seems as though when they built the building, they knew that the school board needed an office. So they kind of built this space with the school board in mind, knowing that they could rent it to them. Over here on the right is the main floor. So you would come up these stairs into the main reading room of the library. And you'll note here, no bookshelves out here. So at this time, the library was designed to have all closed stacks. And some things I've read say that um, this was partly Erastus's doing, that Erastus was afraid that people were just gonna steal the books. So he wanted them in closed stacks, so you had to ask for them at the desk. So here would have been the main desk. This is cataloging over here, the attendance room over here, these are all big tables, magazines over here. There's a ladies reading room down here. Don't know what went on in there. And newspapers over here. This is the librarian's room and the director's room. And then you can see back here, these stacks. Um, I also wanna point out that you could get to the stacks from this floor by going through these doorways, but then to get up, you had to use the stairs inside the stacks. There are also, if you compare the two floors, not all of the staircases line up exactly. And that's kind of an issue. Um, you know, we, we talk about this beautiful building and we're all sad that it's, it's gone. Um, but you have to understand some of the issues that it might have presented. So the staircases confuse me and that might be one of the issues. So then here's the third floor and it actually says fourth floor stack room. So there was one more floor of stacks above this and uh, along here, no books, no reading rooms. These were, um, Art League Studio, um, the Art Gallery, Classrooms. Um, the third floor was home to the Peoria Art and Medical Societies for several years. So again, it was a building that was designed with lots of different purposes. Um, also, this rectangle 
is a balcony. So it was open to the reading room below and there were archways up here. Um, and again, the big staircase here. So there was really just one staircase to get from the lower level up to here. And you see some, some very small restrooms here. But these are very neat uh, floor plans. I'm really glad we were able to find them. And here is a picture of inside the main library. And you can see back here the closed stacks. And you can kind of see how the floors don't quite add up. Um, this is the doorway that would take you back into those stacks from the desk. Uh, car catalogs over here along the side. I believe in one report I read, it said that the stacks had seven and a half foot ceilings. So much taller ceilings out here in the reading room, but seven and a half feet back there in the stacks. I also want to point out right along here, if you look closely, you can see that there is a quote carved in this wood. Um, this is a quote from Shakespeare, and I'm blanking on which it's from one of his his histories. I don't, it might be, it's either Titus Andronicus or Coriolanus or one of the kings. I can't don't remember. Don't look at me, Shakespeare was not my thing. <laughs> right, it's come and take choice of all my library and so beguile thy sorrows, I believe is what that says. Um, and this we have in the library building. It's on lower level two in our conference room mounted on the wall. So we're very grateful to still have that from that building. And you can see up here the, the third floor balcony with the big, beautiful archways. Here's another view. You can see that desk up there. Um, you can see some books kind of creeping out. This is probably taken at a later time. Also, I think it's neat that you can see this drinking fountain over here. And you kind of get a better view. It's a little more well lit that you can see a better view of the stacks here. It looks like there was probably a metal railing along the front there. And it looks like maybe we have electric lights at this point. Um, it's interesting to note the changes in technology as you look at these pictures. This I know is not a great picture. It's kind of, of light. I tried to brighten it up as much as I could. Uh, this is a librarian's office. Um, I just thought that was kind of a neat picture. I wanted to show as many neat pictures of the inside of this building as I could. This, another really cool thing, this is the periodical rack. I want to point out that the light fixture is right here to give you some perspective. This was six feet high, 10 feet, four inches long, two feet deep at the base, and it had 108 pockets for periodicals. Um, it's kind of hard to read the titles, but I, I haven't been able to recognize any titles that we maybe still have. Um, like here's American Naturalist. Well, um, we certainly wouldn't have these now because uh, most of our historical magazine collection um, has uh, disintegrated or was not well yeah. kept. Yeah. So, also, um, you know, those hooligan teenagers were. Yeah, they cut out all the out of them. Yeah. yeah. Probably the sports, probably the car ones. It was a photography magazine, I think, that they were cutting pictures out of. And uh, it said that Erastus had to send it away to be replaced. So apparently you could do that. All right. We're moving along in history. We're going to talk about the library at war in times of war. Um, World War I, this is Dallas Sweeney, or Dahl. And he started working for the library in 1901, right after he graduated high school. He was 18 years old. Um, in 1917, he was 34. And he decided that he was going to join the, the cavalry. And so this is an excerpt from the board minutes um, saying that the board would hold his position for him while he went to serve in the war. Um, he was a photographer. You can see him on the left in the red circle. Um, he's in Luxembourg and um, has a camera 
he was in the cavalry, he was in the trenches, but apparently he had a camera with him. The picture on the right is of later years when he was working at the library. Um, we don't know a lot about how else the library was impacted during World War I. It's, it's been very frustrating for me trying to find information about this because the library scrapbooks have a big gaping hole in the middle of World War I. So I don't know if Dallas Sweeney was in charge of the scrapbooks and nobody did it while he was gone. I don't know what happened, but nobody clipped anything until about 1923. So we don't know if the library was in the news during World War I. Um, Occasionally, I, if Deb and I are researching during that time, or even Chris, um, if we find something related to the library, we'll, you know, clip it, but we don't really stick it into the books because um, it would damage them. Yeah, and I asked uh, a retired librarian if she knew if there was anything, and she said, no, but you could just start looking at the microfilm and see if you find anything. Um, which would mean looking through rolls and rolls and rolls and morning and afternoon and evening papers from that time period. No, and that time we had three newspapers in Peoria, so it would have yeah. been a lot of- And we just didn't have time to do that. So, so we didn't do that. Um, but we do know from talking to some other people that there was a coal shortage possibly that would have affected um, probably the heat and other um, things in the library and that German books were censored. And remember I said the German Library Association had donated their collection. So probably there was some um, issue there with the German books in the library. Uh, and then this is really neat. This is a newspaper article from 1941, but it's Del Sweeney talking about his memory of the uh, armistice. Um, Dahl retired in 1950 from the library after almost 50 years. I don't think he wanted to retire at this time. The, there's a newspaper article in the library scrapbook that said he had to have major surgery. And it doesn't seem like he quite recovered from that. And he was kind of forced well, into retirement. Yeah, he had, he had used all of his sick and vacation time. And I'm guessing in 1950, there wasn't things like FMLA uh, around. <laughs> Yeah, um, mm -hmm. he would have yeah. he would have been uh, in his late sixties at that point. Yeah. So mm -hmm. um, he chose yeah. instead to resign slash retire rather than uh, mm -hmm. you know be forced be out. out. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So he and he had lived in the same house on Spring Street, eight oh seven Spring, his entire life. He lived there until his death. He died in 1958. And if you think you've heard the name Dallas Sweeney before, um, several years ago, that house was going to be demolished and they found a bunch of glass negatives in the basement or the attic. Um, and they were all of the pictures that he had taken. He was an avid amateur photographer. Um, at one point he took a trip out West to study the Peoria Indians and had a lot of pictures from that. Okay, so World War II, again, kind of a gaping hole. I don't know who was in charge of uh, keeping records at that time. It could I be. I call that it. Yeah, it wasn't me. Wasn't me. <laughs> um, it, there was a note um, actually in the minutes of the children's department is where I found the most information that um, there was a lot of staff turnover during this time because staff were joining military service accepting civilian war posts or marrying GIs and leaving Peoria. So um, perhaps they, uh, they had a lot of staff turnover so nobody was keeping records. Um, yes, I, I, was, I failed to mention that the children's room did eventually open on a lower level um, after they expanded and no longer needed the income from that. Yes. Um, on the left is a document I found of blackout rules of, you know, the process and procedure that they had to follow at the main library when there was a blackout. On the right is a picture of a book drive. They collected books to be sent to the USO. Um, they don't have 
an exact number, but um, in 1943, they reported over 75,000 items that had been collected. And there is a newspaper article that describes the type of books they were looking for, um, some like technical manuals, repair manuals, things like that. And then here are a couple of other documents I found um, regarding World War II that uh, on the left is concerning the Japanese. And this is from the librarian at the time, Earl Browning, saying that they would not discriminate at all against um, Japanese, Germans, Italians, no discrimination against anyone. Um, a couple of years ago, we had a display at the library uh, about the Japanese during World War II, that Peoria was a city where Japanese could go to, and I forget what they called those cities, uh, sanctuary cities maybe. I think it was sanctuary cities or something yeah. similar. They could go to um, go to school or to work. So a lot of women came to nursing college and um, other people went to Bradley and they worked at the hospitals and at Caterpillar. And so Peoria was a very friendly town to the Japanese during World War II. And then on the right, speaking of Caterpillar, is a letter saying that there would be extra workers in town working at Caterpillar for the war effort. And so they should be given a library card for that. But if they didn't return them on time, that they were going to call their boss and let them know that they were delinquent. Yes. So not exactly the same treatment as a regular card holder, um, but they were given certain permission. Yeah. Okay. So moving into the modern era. Um, but first, I do want to mention, because I forgot these notes, the children's room opened on the first floor in 1910. Um, so the school board was there from 1897 to 1910. And there is a scandal involving the school board in the library that we will talk about in part three of the history. The business room opened on the first floor in 1926. Also in 1926, they opened an education room on the third floor. It was 30 years before the front wing was fully used and 40 years before the stacks in the back were fully used. All Not right. bad for, you know, planning for expansion. It's pretty good. They, they did well in their planning. So post-World War II, this is Xenophon Smith in the director's office. Um, and actually we still have, I know we have this painting and I can't quite tell what the others are, but I bet we still have them. And these cabinets, there's one that looks off an awfully lot like this in the director's office currently. Uh, 1963, here's a staff picture, which I think is just great. Um, I also want you to look in the background and see how the library has changed because now we have shelves of books out where the public can get to them. We have card catalogs where there used to be an enclosed- no, no, no. Those, those are microfilm. Oh, right, those yeah. are microfilm cabinets and here are microfilm readers. Um, card catalog out here, shelves of books along the wall. Uh, the two staff members I have circled here, this uh, woman right here is Felicia Ryan, and I will talk about her more in a minute. This woman here is Betty Roberson. Betty worked for the library from 1950 until 2002. Uh, so- I, I started working there and she quit. I mean- Yeah. <laughs> yeah. And unfortunately, Betty died not long after she retired and she really devoted her life um, to the library and so did Felicia Ryan. So I, I wanted to point them out um, and I'm sure there are other people. We think one of the gentlemen in the back here might be Romeo B. Garrett. I believe he was on the library board at the time. And here is the front desk now. So if you'll remember in the pictures of the library, right after it opened, there was a big wooden desk and it was very formal. And now see, we have Betty sitting here on the left and it's just a couple of little metal desks um, and they're ready to provide reference and reader's assistance. This is the children's department 
downstairs. Um, I don't have an exact date on this picture, but you can see these four ladies ready to help. And um, if you look back here, it says second floor. So this is where they were sorting out books to go to the correct floors. And it says return books here on the front. And this picture on the wall looks to me like a painting we still have. It might be one of the flat boats on the river. Here are a couple of other shots of the library in more modern times. Um, on the left, you can see the main floor. Again, the, the shelves have moved out into the public space. Uh, I believe this is that periodical rack, that six foot tall, 10 foot long periodical rack over here. So still in use. Um, and then on the right is the children's department. You can see that same desk from the earlier picture and that same painting on the wall. Um, but they don't have the shelving behind them. <laughs> <laughs> they don't, um, but we have shelves out here for children to access and we have electric lights. And this one is neat. Um, this, I believe, had a caption on the back about um, this being after school. High school students would come and use the library for homework. It got very, very busy. Um, because the library hadn't really been designed with like departments in mind, you can see a desk just kind of out here in the public area where a librarian is working. Um, also, we believe that these white things hanging down from the ceiling were probably pull cords for electric lights because they didn't have electric lights in 1897 when this library was built. Um, and so Carla, I, I think these files up in the front, I think that's the rudimentary um, vertical file. Oh, right here in the, in the front right. Yes, I believe so. Yes. And then look at all of these card catalogs. These are all card catalogs here. So that would have been quite a lot. And they're using them. Uh, the audio visual department. You'll remember over here, there was a house. And I don't know when that house was demolished. Um, but they decided they needed an audiovisual department. They didn't have room for it inside. Um, we don't have a date on this picture, but judging by the cars, it was probably the late 40s, early 50s. Um, film start service started in 1949 in the audiovisual department, and they started rent lending phonograph records in 1951. There was some controversy between 1950 and 1953. What would have been happening at that time? Um, the Americanism Committee of the American Legion Post Number Two believed that some of the films were communist propaganda. And so they didn't think the library should be showing these, didn't think anyone should have access to them. So there was a compromise that the library would hold public previews for all new films. Anyone could come preview them and make sure they were okay for human consumption. Um, but attendance was very poor and they didn't have to do that for very long. In 1958, they formed the Illinois Valley Film Cooperative. It was an agreement between Peoria Public Library and six additional communities. Peoria loaned films at a cost to other libraries and then the funds from that were used to purchase new films. So today we can get you something from anywhere in the country um, so this was probably pretty revolutionary for them in 1958 to be sending these films to these other communities. And check out the films in the front of the picture, how big those boxes are. Yes. I don't know how they transported them. I wonder if they had a- Very carefully. A well, yes, but like a delivery driver or how did they do that? Um, other things that happened in the 50s, in 1952, October 20th, 1952, the first courtesy book return box was installed at the main library. So the first book drop was installed in 1952. I'm assuming before then you would have had to bring your materials in the building to the desk. And in 1955, October 16th to be precise, they um, introduced the first public access to photocopying, which probably for 1955 was 
pretty advanced. This is a neat picture of a broadcasting booth in the audiovisual department. They could record and broadcast radio programs. Um, this is Mrs. Constance Jansen, chief of the audiovisual department, interviewing the uh, librarian or director, as we would call him, Xenophon Smith. And I believe from the lines on the picture, it was probably used in a newspaper. Pictures that are cropped like this, um, that usually means that they were cropped and put in the newspaper. So building the new library, which would be the current building that we have now. So why? Why did they need to build a new building? This was a beautiful building. It seems such a shame. And I know I agree with you. It looks like it was a really beautiful building. Um, these are pictures that were used at the time to show the public why they needed a new library. So the one on the left shows after school. Um, it got very, very crowded and there wasn't a lot of room. They were running out of room for high school students. And as I showed you before, the librarian's desk could have been right in the middle of this um, and they, they just needed more room. On the right, this was the men's restroom, the one public men's restroom. It was on the third floor. Um, it doesn't look very inviting to me. On the left here is the boiler room and they use this boiler room for storage. They had plastic sheeting covering books to protect them from dampness and dust. You can see in the background of this picture is where the maintenance department stored things. Um, on the right is one of the hand operated lifts. They had two hand operated lifts in the building. It was the only way that they could move books between floors. And since they had five levels of stacks, there were a lot of floors to move books in. And they were too small to be mechanized. They couldn't uh, turn them into electric lifts or something like that. Um, and that we really like our elevators now. You can put oh, a, yes. Yes, a truck do. full of books on an elevator and run them up and down. And I don't know what we would do without them. I, so, I would guess that this could at most hold 20 books before you would have it too heavy because remember they are doing this by hand. That's So correct. they have to be able yeah. to pull it up and down. They have to make sure that the books are secure so they, they don't fall down the shaft. Mm -hmm. um, and think of all the get, time that would take. Yeah. I, I would imagine if they had hired pages at this time, which I'm not sure they did, um, you would have been running up and down flights of stairs with armfuls of books to put away. So yeah. it'd be a good way to get your 10,000 steps of the day. It would. Um, <laughs> but I don't think they had as much problem getting their steps in at that time. Right. Yeah. So, um, and I don't know if you would have just had to have somebody there all day to move books up and down. I don't know. I'm glad we don't have to deal with that. These pictures are showing the, the staircase, the big grand staircase. Um, they said that there would be a chimney effect if the building caught fire, it could go right up that staircase and up through that balcony. Um, and actually I consulted Mr. Ed Berry, uh, a former board member, good friend to the library and one of the architects on the latest library building project. And he said that actually the current main library has a skylight now. And the original thought was that they could take that skylight all the way down to the lower level, the, the lowest basement level. But they would have had to have some sort of fire suppression system. And they would have had to enclose that shaft completely in glass for safety so that nobody fell or dropped anything. So there is some truth um, to the claim that fire could have just shot up through the center of this big open space. Um, also, it wasn't uh, ADA compliant. Think about a person who um, can't walk very well, uses a wheelchair, uses a walker, and they want to come into the library. You enter down here and immediately had to go up the stairs to get to the main reading room. Um, 
So just I'm not... just thinking of the mother with like three children and a stroller. Right. Yeah. Um, I'm thinking of people with mobility issues. I'm thinking mm -hmm. people who all they want to do at the end of the day, they don't want to climb two flights of stairs to check out a library book. Exactly. Yeah. Another thing I asked Mr. Barry was, why did they have to put extra supports under the building? Was this just poor construction? I, Because I asked some other people, what other buildings were built in 1897? Well, the Women's Club and maybe the GAR Hall, and they're still standing. And uh, Mr. Barry's best guess was that perhaps they had not built it to hold the weight of the materials. So I believe this is the front part of the building. It did not have a true basement. It had a crawl space. Um, you can see the extra supports here. They didn't intend for there to be shelves of books in that front part of the library. And so as the library collection grew and um, services changed and they put those books out where the public could get to them, perhaps the building just wasn't strong enough to hold the weight of all those books. So Anybody who's carried a stack of books knows how heavy they get. <laughs> yes, yeah. So these are some of the many reasons why they needed a new building. So where are we gonna put it? So here's a map of 1967 or 68 Peoria. And the first location, they said, well, we can put it at the riverside of Washington at Fulton. Amber, what is on the riverside of Washington at Fulton? Uh, I do believe the uh, Riverfront Museum. Uh, no, it would be the Caterpillar Global oh, Headquarters. That, okay, I was one block off. So. I think. No, it's not so, the it's not the headquarters. It's the thing next to the Riverfront Museum. Yeah. No, 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 no. It is, is it the museum. It is, it is the museum. That's all. Okay. Important. So Sears, Sears was there. Yeah. So it wasn't there at the time, but the city or someone was trying to get Sears to come in. So they said, no, you can't build the library there. We're trying to get Sears. So Washington between Maine and Hamilton, what's there? Washington between Maine and Hamilton, uh, I believe is now uh, Caterpillar. Caterpillar, yes. So at the time they knew Caterpillar was thinking about building there, but the library didn't know that. So they said, no, you can't have the library there. Caterpillar is gonna build there. Then they said Adams and Hamilton, um, I believe a bank building was had just purchased that. And Kelly Seed is there now. Yes, and we don't want to move Kelly Seed. Mm -mm. So they couldn't build there. The city said, we have a great idea. Eckwood Park. You can build right on the riverfront. Eckwood Park will put it on stilts and we'll build a pedestrian bridge across the train tracks. And the library said, that's terrible. Children come here after school. They're going to run across the train tracks and get hit and killed. So we did not build on Equid Park. And that's probably knowing the history of that land now. Um, the lovely floods we get there. Yeah, it's probably a good thing they didn't build there. So then they said, how about Madison between Hamilton and Fayette or where the library is now? And they looked at the bus schedule and all but one bus line went right past the Main and Monroe location. So they decided to stay where they were. Now this was only a problem because they would have to move the library to a temporary location. If they were able to build in a different location, they could leave the library open almost until the day they had to move. Um, but this just meant they had to find a temporary location. First, they had to get money, so they held some open houses. And this is uh, one of the open houses they held where they showed people what the new building would look like. And we did similar things in 2007. And here is some information about the bond. Um, they had to get the taxpayer's permission, of course, and they tried first in 1964, they were asking for 2.8 million and the, uh, it failed by 20 votes. So they asked for a recount and it won by one vote. So they asked for a recount and they lost by nine. 
So they said, forget it, we'll try again. So in 1965, they tried again. At that point, Richwoods Township had been added to the city. They were also asking for more money at that point because building costs and land prices had increased. Remember that they only owned interior lots. They would have had to buy lots to the corner because the current building goes all the way to the corner of Main and Monroe. And so the cost had increased to 3.2 million. But because of the addition of Richwoods Township, the cost to taxpayers actually decreased. And that uh, passed by 2,795 votes. No need for a recount that time. So they had a plan, they had permission from the taxpayers, time to think about moving. But first, we have to salvage items. Um, the article on the right was written by Theo Jean Kenyon. It is February 19th, 1966. Um, there was some talk of just getting rid of everything. We're just gonna throw everything away. We don't wanna waste money trying to save anything. Um, I think one board member says, um, well, you don't wanna like not have a window because you had to save something. You don't wanna spend money saving something at the expense of having windows in your new building, which we know there are no windows in the new building. <laughs> so true, so true. We don't know what sunlight looks like, but uh, an assistant librarian said, I think there would be a great hue and cry from the public if you didn't save the owl. This was the owl, terracotta owl on the peak of the roof. Also interesting, remember Felicia Ryan. One staff member of the library, Miss Felicia Ryan, has asked for the doorknob from the back door, and yet another put in a request for the chandelier in the reference room. We don't know who got what. I hope that Felicia Ryan got that doorknob um, because it doesn't seem like a lot to ask for, um, but we don't know who got what. Well, we, have, we, we kind of do. We do we a have, little bit. We've gotten some well, things back. Well, the uh, the quote that we have yes. was salvaged and it was donated to us by Theo Jean Kenyon. Who wrote the article. Yes. Mm -hmm. So she got the quote. Um, ultimately, what was decided is what happens a lot in construction projects. They said, well, the construction site belongs to the contractor. So the contractor gets to decide what happens. And so they, they sold a bunch of stuff. There's another article that talks about everything that was sold and how many people came and bought it. So if you have something from the old library and you would like to give it back to us, we would love to have it. Um, so Unless it's that book that you forgot to return 60 years ago and it's covered we don't in want it desk, we don't want that. Yeah. <laughs> so Felicia Ryan, I want to talk about her because I think she was a, a pretty neat lady. She was born in 1905. She started working as a librarian in 1926. While she was working at the library, she got her bachelor's degree in library science from the U of I. She worked in every branch of the library that existed at that point, and she retired in 1970. Um, she never married, didn't have any children, another person who devoted her entire life to the library. Um, and she died in 1994. Um, we have some pictures of her later in life. She came back for the 50th anniversary of the McClure branch in 1987. Uh, so then they had to move and you'll see the federal warehouse boxes. I believe federal warehouse is where uh, library materials were stored 10 years ago when we had to empty the main library. So federal warehouse and the library have a pretty good relationship. On the right, you can see they're moving films. Again, on the left federal warehouse, it looks like they're moving a microfilm cabinet on the right is them saving that owl from the top of the roof. And then um, here is demolition of the library, but also a groundbreaking in the front here. So you can see they've, they've demolished that front part that was three floors and it looks like all that's left is those five floors. This is the Methodist church building in the back to orient you a little bit um, that they've now added onto. They moved into temporary quarters. Um, this was the second floor and the basement of Johnson's men's clothing store at Adams and Fulton. 
Um, I'm not you sure what they moved about six blocks away. Mm -hmm. yeah. And I'm not sure what the arrangement was there, like if they paid rent or, or how that came about. Here is the sign that we saw in the old building. And this is the one picture we were able to find of the temporary quarters in operation. You know, honestly, it looks a lot like how we looked when we were under construction 10 years yeah. ago in the basement. Yeah, and the local history and genealogy department had to move to WTVP at that time. Uh, this is a neat picture of them digging the basement. Um, we have two basement levels, so they had to go down pretty far. Um, and they added the basement annex. So we have closed stacks that are basically under the parking lot now. And they added that later. So on March 23rd, 1968, they opened the new main library building. Um, the picture on the right is from that opening day. And here is a picture from the first day of this man and his daughter checking out some books. And the back of the picture said it was a tremendous crowd all day long. Um, here's head librarian, William Bryan. And this is Mrs. Martha Jackson at the circulation de desk. And um, look how she is dressed to the nines. She's had her hair done recently and she's wearing a corsage because it's a very important day. It's the first day of the new library. And this is just a fun picture we took a few years ago of um, where the old library building would have been in relation to the new library building. And that brings us to the end of this part. Um, I do, I had another poll I wanted to throw out there really quickly and just see how many of you remember visiting that old main library building. Um, because I know there are still people out there who remember that building. Um, we have a couple. Oh, four. I'm not going to ask you how old you are. I don't want to embarrass anybody, but this is exciting. Five people. That's great. Um, I know there are people who remember that building. Um, I really wish I could have seen that building. I love old buildings. I love libraries. Um, so it's, and I know it's kind of a sensitive topic to some people who, who remember it and love it, um, but we can't go back and change the past. So um, now I'm going to answer any questions there are that we haven't gotten to. So I'm going to open the Q and A. Um, oh, Roberta's pointing out who people are. <laughs> TJ with the sign. Oh, okay. In the, um, when they moved. Okay. Bobby Rice had to come in to get films for Bradley University classes and return them. So you would have gone to the audiovisual department. And Roberta says that she and Erastus are both neat and tidy. Yes, Roberta, you are just as neat and tidy as Erastus. <laughs> and Bobby, you also remember um, the children's department, I understand. Let's see what's going on in the chat. Titus Andronicus, thank you, Alice. Um, seeing if there are any other questions. I don't have any questions. Um, I am going to throw in the chat. Um, See if I can. When you exit this webinar, you will hopefully be directed to a link to the next presentation, part two. Um, Jackie, you spotted a bust of Wilcox. Are you sure it wasn't John Lee? I think it was John Lee. Um, Marilyn Leland recalling the glass floors and the stacks with open spaces underfoot that allowed airflow through the stacks. Oh my gosh, I've been in, I was I was in a Carnegie library a couple of years ago that had glass floors like that and they were scary. 
Wow, um, interesting. You know, in the library book, they talk about how the fire moved up through the stacks. And so I wonder if it was a similar arrangement that they had like spaces so air could flow through that also allowed fire to flow oh, through. Oh, I'm sure. <laughs> um, hey, Roberta, I think uh, Carla and I need to have a library exploration thing and go around and look at old library buildings so that we can well, uh, compare ours. I have already requested um, in our quest to visit um, the graves of dead directors, I requested to go to Arizona and I was denied. Oh, we're not going to get to see who is there, Xenophon? Xenophon Smith is in Arizona and I was told that we could not do that just to take a picture. Uh, <laughs> well, out. Yeah, uh, we have some raised hands. Those of you who raised hands, do you have a question? Uh, great time to do a display or article on the Japanese sanctuary in Peoria about World War II. Well, we had a really great exhibit a few years ago. Um, and I, I personally don't know enough about that story to do it justice. Um, it might I would still be accessible online. Yes, I would bet Chris, Christopher Ferris could help with that. Chris Ferris in our local history department, I believe helped with some of the research on that. Also, um, there's a professor at Bradley, Rustin Get Gates. Um, he was instrumental in doing the research on that as well. Northwestern's Deering Library had to be reinforced. Oh yeah. See, there are people who will say that the old library building could have been saved if they had spent the money to fix it instead of building a new building. Um, and I don't know, you know, I don't know enough to answer that question. Uh, segregation of libraries. I don't know. Does anyone know if there was any issue with segregation in the library? Um, certainly not in the staff from the picture we have of the 1963 staff um there are one or two uh people of color in the staff um you know i haven't seen any stories i haven't seen anything in the library scrapbook about segregation um i so i don't know it's quite possible that could be answered tomorrow since that was a staff member who asked. I could probably. <laughs> yeah, you, you can go do your own research. <laughs> <laughs> yes. Um, okay. What time is it? We are almost at our 7 30 um, end time. Does anyone have any other questions? I do encourage you to come to our other sessions. Oh, I should talk about our next program. Um, part two will be uh, history from 1968 to the present, but it will not focus just on the main library. We cover a lot more, uh, including branches. So if you are someone um, who remembers your neighborhood branch, we have some wonderful pictures. I would love to hear your stories. Um, I'm going to try to cover all of the branches that existed and talk about other things like outreach. Um, there was outreach to hospitals, the tuberculosis sanitarium, um, St. Jude's schools. We have pictures of librarians in St. Jude. Um, Mrs. Bryan works at the Bradley Library. Interesting. Bobby Rice, you know a lot of things. Uh, <laughs> So it's just, it's very interesting. So part two will cover branches, outreach, and more modern history. Um, and then part three, we're covering scandals, controversies, curses, and riots. Um, we are going to talk about the sensitive topics that we don't always talk about. Um, so it should be a good time. Yes. It should be a good time. Um, we're gonna air our dirty laundry basically, um, but we're gonna 
we're going to cite sources and we're going to try to do it in as respectful a way as possible um, when we talk about some of these things. And we will be talking about Lincoln Branch and the city cemetery. Um, so that should be a good time. So the second one, part two will be May 6th. Part three will be June 10th. Um, by then we will be well into summer reading. I hope to see you all there. Um, thank you all for coming tonight. Um, yes, Marilyn Leland, part three will be June 10th. These are all Thursdays. Um, and as was pointed out to me, I promise it was not intentional. There are no conflicts with Cubs games on any of these dates. Oh, sure there should be. There should always be conflicts with Cub games. There aren't. <laughs> <laughs> it was purely happenstance. Um, but thank you for coming. Um, if you have any questions that you think of at a later time, feel free to email us uh, or call. Um, and if you want to see more cool pictures, you can come into the local history and genealogy department and ask to see some pictures. Um, because we have a lot more, but again, we wanted to keep this to under five hours. Yes, thank you, Alice, for the email address there. All right, thank you very much. Have a good night, people.